unless you're a Roman Catholic or Eastern Orthodox Christian, the term Lent might be somewhat unfamiliar to you. Lent is an annual period of spiritual preparation that spans the 40 days, not counting Sundays, which precede Easter, the most important Christian holiday. During the six weeks of Lent, Christians commonly pray, fast, engage in self-examination, and seek to improve their devotion to God. In the New Testament, Jesus is said to have spent 40 days in the wilderness, praying, fasting, and battling the temptations of the devil. During Lent, Christians seek to mirror Jesus' journey by trying to renew themselves spiritually through acts of self-denial. In some denominations of Christianity, it is common to give up one specific thing for Lent, something you really enjoy, like dessert, alcohol, or some other favored food. Not sure giving up Brussels sprouts will count. In Eastern Orthodox tradition, practitioners typically engage in a more rigorous Lenten fast, often giving up entire food groups, like all meat or all dairy products, for six weeks. Lent has been part of Christian practice for many centuries. It was first institutionalized in the fourth century, and in the sixth century it was set to begin on Ash Wednesday, the day on which some Christians go to church to have the priest mark their forehead with ashes as a symbol of their repentance. The Lenten season concludes with Holy Week, the most sacred week leading up to Easter. Though some Christians do not engage in Lent as a special season of preparation, nearly all Christian denominations celebrate Easter as the culmination of the Gospel message. Hey, good morning, everybody. Good morning, and welcome to Central Community Church of God's online worship service for March 3rd, 2024. My name is Malcolm Bolduc, and I'm so blessed and honored to be called pastor of this wonderful gathering of believers and searchers alike here in Hanford, California. On this third Sunday of Lent, we wanted to take this opportunity to welcome you and your loved ones, as well as challenge you. In John chapter 4, we read the wonderful story of Jesus meeting the the Samaritan woman at the well was welcoming to her despite the fact that Jews and Samaritans were filled with hate for each other. Of course, Jesus knew nothing about hating people, so he took this time to, to meet her and meet this woman. And he answered her questions and in turn welcomed her as, welcomed her as a new believer in him as the Messiah. And as they were standing beside the well, Jesus said these words to her. He says, anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty again. But those who drink the water I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh, bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. Now let me assure you that today this same water is available to each and every one of us who gather together on these Sundays, leading up to the day that we celebrate His resurrection. One thing you will notice about the woman, and, and that is that following her coming to Christ physically, she also came to him spiritually, which, which was indicated by her going back to the city to tell others about him. When we really have an encounter with the Lord, we will have a desire to tell others about what we have experienced. We will not want to keep it a secret and become undercover Christians, but the good news will burn in our hearts and in our lives. So let's take the time to re be repentant of our sins, but remember that God wants us to be witnesses to a world that really, really desperately needs to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, during this Lenten season, help us to recognize our sins and turn our hearts towards you in genuine repentance. Lord, grant us the strength to make amends and grow in your grace. In this moment, Lord, in this morning, in this moment, we come to you and we lay our lives before you. And may we just honor and worship and adore you with every fiber of our being. Father, we proclaim that you are the Holy One, the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Your beauty and majesty are beyond compare. 
And on this day, we join with all those who worship and confess you as Lord, from generations past and present, and with all the angels that sing in heaven of your greatness and splendor. We confess this in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Church, Psalm 62 says that God is our rock. He is our firm foundation. He's our fortress, and we will not be shaken. We're going to worship the Lord together because he is good, and he's so faithful to do what he says he's going to do. So come on, let's worship together. Sing worthy. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever breathe. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Come on, let's sing holy. Holy, there is no one alive. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Jesus, the name above every other name. Oh, Jesus. Jesus, the only one you could ever say, so worthy, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you, we live for you. Oh 
trust in you, we can trust in you. You are the anchor. Come on, we believe that Christ is our solid rock, so let's sing this together. Christ alone, cornerstone, the weak made strong in Savior's love. simply say that you can have control of our lives. We give it all to you. In Jesus' name, amen. John 2, verses 13 through 22 says, It was nearly time for the Jewish Passover celebration, so Jesus went to Jerusalem. In the temple area, he saw merchants selling cattle, sheep, and doves for sacrifices. He also saw dealers at tables exchanging pouring money. Jesus made a whip from some ropes and chased them all out of the temple. He drove off the sheep and cattle. He scattered the money changers' coins over the floor and turned over their tables. Then going over to the people who sold doves, he told them, Get these things out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a marketplace. Then his disciples remembered this prophecy from the scriptures. Passion for God's house will consume me. But the Jewish leaders demanded, what are you doing? If God gave you authority to do this, show us a miraculous sign to prove it. All right, Jesus replied, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. What, they exclaimed, it has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you can rebuild it in three days? But then Jesus said, this temple, he meant his own body. After it was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered he had said this, and they believed both the scriptures and what Jesus had said. See, every time we study this story in Bible study, someone will ask, isn't this covered by the other Gospels later in Jesus' ministry? And the answer is yes. The answer is yes. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all cover the same story late in his ministry, but John wants his disciples and us to know up front that Jesus came here for a far greater purpose than they or we could understand in the beginning. Jesus wasn't just chasing away the rightful merchants on the temple grounds, but in fact prophesying his own death and resurrection which would replace any need for future sacrifices or a temple. He was God's son. He was God in the flesh. No further need for sacrifice, sacrifices. The Jews and the poor disciples, knowing what the little they knew at the time, couldn't begin to understand what Jesus was doing or what he was saying. John, writing many years later, knew the good news of Easter and the eventual destruction of, temp of the temple. And as we approach Easter, I'm always drawn to hearing John's words in the Holy Week. I marvel at the courage of Jesus facing a certain death, alone, alone, deserted by his followers, and how they just, how they just didn't get it until the resurrection. Jesus going to the cross changed everything. Jesus going to the cross changed everything. Let's pray.
Dear God, help us to pay attention to what the Scriptures tell us and trust that God is always with us even now. So come, Lord Jesus, come. Amen. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans for a hope and a future. Can we sing the promises of God over our lives together? Let's worship the Lord wherever you are, whatever you're going through. Let's sing about his promises. Never
promises never fail. Your promises never fail. Your promises never fail. Your promises never fail. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You're the same. You're the same. today we say that we trust you with all that we have no matter what's going on around us we say we trust in you in Jesus name amen folks I would like to look at some of the significant moments in the life of the Lord during his time among the people on the earth Attempting to see, perhaps, in the light of our own circumstances, that we might realize the tremendous practical import of these moments of crisis in the life of Jesus Christ. We begin in the first event of his ministry following his baptism by John when he was led of the Spirit in the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. We turn again to Matthew 4, verses 1 through 11, where it says that Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And he fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterward he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, Throw yourself down, for it is written, He will give His angels charge of you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus said to him, Again, it is written, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Again the devil took him up to a very high mountain, and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And he said to him, All these I will give you, if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is, it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. Folks, there's nothing more important for us than to understand the earthly life of Jesus Christ. There's a very mistaken concept among Christians today that Jesus came to show us what God was like and how he would behave amongst men. I think this is far from the truth. For Jesus did not come to show us how God behaves. It's true that he came to reveal the Father in his character. That's true. But in his activity, he came to reveal man as God intended man to be. In everything he did, we see man acting as God intended man to act from the very beginning. At the very heart of that manifestation is therefore the key and the secret of human life. The principle on which he lived is the principle on which God intended humans to live and, and by which we are to live. This is what makes life, this is what makes life make sense as nothing else does. This is what makes life make sense as nothing else does. Throughout our Lord's ministry, he reminded us continually of that great principle, not only by his words, but by his deeds. 
He declared it again and again and stated that this is the greatest of all truths. In Matthew 22, 37 through 38, he says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. This is the expression of the trust and the dependence that makes human life make sense. As we've said from time to time, it takes God to be a man or, or woman as it takes Christ to be a Christian. To put, you put Christ back into the Christian and you put God back into the person. This is the revolutionary claim of Christianity, to be sure. Unfortunately, it is often obscure today, in our day today. This is why there are so many false claims and so much, so much attempt is being made to substitute something dramatic, something eye-catching, something which would appeal to the human heart to distinguish Christianity from, uh, from other religious faith. That is because we've lost the vital claim that is already part of Christianity if we preach it as it is in Scripture. The great and radical claim of Christianity is that Jesus Christ offers to live his human life all over again in you, in your circumstance, in the midst of the situations that you face daily. He will be there with you. Now we shall see that principle put to the test. In this account of the temptation of the Lord Jesus, we see him going out into the wilderness, driven out of the, driven out of the spirit to be tempted as a man. He was tempted as a human being, therefore his temptations are our temptations. That is why this account is so tremendously fascinating, so gripping, and so practical for us. Because this is exactly the form of temptation we are continually facing day by day, all of us. If we discover the secret of how Jesus met it, we shall, we shall know how to meet temptation in our own lives. And I think it's important to point out three additional facts about this account before we examine it in detail. The first is that temptation does not come to us because we are sinners. Temptation comes to us because we're human beings. It was not as a sinner that Jesus was tempted, and, and our being sinners does not add anything to the force of temptation. He felt the full force of it simply because he was a human being. He was a man. It is our humanity that makes us subject to the power of temptation. During this temptation, you'll notice that twice the devil says to Jesus, if you are the Son of God. If you are the Son of God. Immediately following the baptism where you have the account of the heavens opening and the Father crying out, this is my beloved Son. Then the devil comes and says, if you are the Son of God. That if does not mean doubt. The devil's not trying to cast doubt on this fact. He knew that Jesus was the Son of God, and the Lord Jesus knew it, and there's never any doubt in his mind that he was. But the if here has the force of, of since. Okay, since you are the Son of God, why not do this? Why not do that? The whole thrust of the temptation of the devil here is to get the Lord Jesus to move off the principle of dependence and trust in the indwelling Father. This is always the thrust of temptation with us as well. The devil attempts to get us to act on our own independently from God and independently of God. That's the nature of temptation. We shall see more of that as we go into this account. One other introductory matter here is to take note of the fact that we are particularly told that when Jesus was led of the Spirit to be tempted, he was taken into a wilderness. Now that might sound, uh, and this may sound, sound a bit strange uh, to us. The first temptation of man occurred in a garden, remember. But this, te this temptation of the second man, the second Adam, so to speak, it occurs in a wilderness. Usually we don't think of a wilderness as a, as a place of temptation, do we? If we want to avoid some of the problems of the temptations of life, we sometimes retreat, we retreat to a wilderness, true. This is where the hermits have always gone, attempting to escape the world, thinking to find relief from temptation in that wilderness. We think of the city as a place of temptation, don't we? The city is the place of temptation. If you want to put a young man or woman under pressure, send them to the city. That's where they'll be exposed to the full power and the allurement of evil, of sin. 
But this account comes to correct our false impressions and show us that temptation does not come from without. Temptation comes from within. Temptation comes from within. It is not the outside force that creates temptation or outward circumstances or situation, but temptation arises from within. Jesus said it's not what goes into a man, but what comes from within that defiles him. You can see how this strikes at the very common misconception that we all have. We think our failures, our faults, our follies are all due to certain outward pressures. If you listen to people talking, you can hear someone explaining why they did such and such. They will say, well, there is nothing else I could do under the circumstances. Or, or we say, well, he or she talked me into it. Or I simply got carried away. It wasn't I who was at fault, you see. It was just that the pressures of the situation were of such, that, of such a nature that, that I could not resist. I was carried away of, by it. It's to blame, not me. It's amazing how ingenuously children sometimes reflect this. I remember a number of years ago, one of, the, one of my grandchildren was engaged in a little conflict with her brother, and we were trying to settle the matter, and I, settled, I said to them, well, who started this? Who started this? And the brother said, she did. She hit me back first. <laughs> As Jesus said, it's not our circumstances, folks but some weakness within, some allurement to which we yield, some inner urge. Jesus, therefore, was driven into a solitary wilderness where nothing outside could allure him. No pressure from without. Into a highly waste, waste-filled desert. There to experience the full force of human temptation. To show us it comes from within, not from without. Now let's look at these temptations. In the first one, the tempter said, said, if you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. I think we will not understand the power of that upon Jesus unless we realize that he had been going without food for 40 days and 40 nights. It's written, that is, it's written in what is perhaps the greatest understatement of scriptures in verse two, from Matthew 4, verse 2, after he fasted 40 days and night, afterwards he was hungry. Well, no kidding. I don't think any of us have been in a position to understand that the word bread must what, what that word bread must have meant to Jesus after 40 days and 40 nights. That sound must have made him drool from his urge of his body just to satisfy his need of hunger. It's indicative and important to note that this temptation arose out of a normal natural need, out of his basic humanity. He's hungry. It isn't wrong, it isn't something wrong with him that caused this, this temptation, his temptation, but simply that he was a human being. See, temptations come to us in, 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 in the same way. Notice how particularly the force of this temptation to him, for we will quick, quickly recognize it in our own lives. What the devil was really saying to Jesus was, look, God doesn't really care for you, does he? If you were the son of God, would he leave you in the wilderness without food for 40 days and nights? Surely he's made some way of providing for your needs to be met if he loves you. So why don't you act upon your innate powers of deity and turn these stones then into bread, if you be the Son of God? His suggestion is that God is either too busy at the moment, too unconcerned, or too something to care for him. There's a subtle pressure here to act upon his own, independent of the Father. On the basis that after all, the hum after all human life is important, after all... He has got to live. He's got to live. The devil's attempt is to reverse the priorities of life and to make the physical, the flesh, the most important thing of all. A couple of Sunday, Sundays ago, listening to a podcast, I heard a report of a random survey taken house to house among some people that lived in Philadelphia. The question was asked, what is the most important lack in your life at the moment? What is it that you need, need, want, or need more than anything else? One lady of the house said they had no hot water available, and that was her greatest need. Another said her greatest need was just for more room. See, it's always based on some material need. This is an example that we have as a race to come to the brainwashing of the tempter. We believe the lie that the physical life is the most important thing. 
And that if God doesn't take adequate care of us, it is proof that He really doesn't love us. Who hasn't heard that temptation? You hear it in those who point out the injustices of life who say, if God is a loving God, as you Christians say, what about these disabled people? How come He allows death, Malcolm? How come He allows war and disappointment and tragedies and cancer and sickness? If God is a God of love, does He not take care of His own? This is the force of the temptation of our Lord. And the power of temptation millions face today, perhaps many right here, listening right now, listening online right now, here at church right now. Now the Lord, now see how the Lord answers here. Immediately He comes back to a proper estimation and understanding of the nature of man. The devil's work is always to twist and distort things and make them look different than they are. And particularly to twist our perspective so that we might see life out of proportion. But our Lord immediately returns to the proper perspective of life. He puts things back on the right basis in focus by quoting the word, this, quoting this word. Man shall not live by, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. Man shall not live by bread alone. It is written, he says. That is, the deepest need in human life is not the physical, never was and never will be. Man is more than animal. Man is, man is more than simply an animated piece of beefsteak, a hunk of meat with a nervous system whose principal need is physical supply. Man shall not live by bread alone, he said. Our Lord is saying it is better to die of hunger in a wilderness in right relationship to the God who made us than to satisfy it at the cost of that relationship. With that thrust, he ended that first temptation, putting life back into focus. This is not my major need in life. He reminded us that we have a deeper need than the physical, and that the temporary lack and the temporary lack of physical supply does not in any way indicate that the God who made us and who is deeply concerned in all areas of our lives has forgotten us or is unconcerned. But now look at the second temptation. The first is on the level of the of the physical, the flesh. This, is, this second one is on the level of the soul. The devil took Jesus into the holy city and he set him on a pinnacle of the temple. He said to him, if you are the Son of God, throw yourself self down. Just throw yourself down. So then he pulls out his trump card. He pulls out his trump card and he says, for it is written, he will give the, his angels charge of you and on, and on them and on their hands they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against a stone. And this is really interesting. It's really interesting. The first temptation was thrust at our Lord's weakness as a man. His basic need for physical supply. His, well, he's hungry. He's his hunger. And in his utter weakness, the devil cruelly tried to exploit that weakness and make him violate his most important of his relations, which was trust in the Father. Now, this is a typically diabolical move to the exact opposite extreme. The devil's saying, well, you trust God, don't you? You trust God, don't you? Yeah, I tried to get you to move apart from that trust, but I see you really but I see you really do trust him. Well, that's excellent. Best thing you could ever do. Now I suggest how can you how can you manifest that trust? If you really want to show how much you trust God, put yourself then in a place of danger. Cast yourself from that pinnacle of the temple, and by that everyone will see that your trust in God is so implicit that you dare put yourself in any any dangerous circumstance. And it says, remember, it is written, He will give His angels charge over you. He will hold you up. He will keep you in all your ways. Now see what a powerful, subtle temptation that was. And it thrust right at the most vital need of humanity. On the level of the soul, our need for wisdom, our need to show the balance of life, how to avoid the extremes. The devil's tactics, see, are always the same. If he can't push you off on this side, he'll push you off on the other side. It doesn't matter which one to him. That's why we so frequently find ourselves vacillating from one extreme to another. If someone has been reared without moral standards, learning to live in lust and self-expression, when they become a Christian, it's very often as uh, uh, become a Christian, it very often happens they switch to to the opposite extreme and plunge into prudery or uh, be kind of just obnoxious. They begin to act as though there's something basically evil about sex. It happens also that if one has been reared according to a strict moral code, 
then oftentimes when they come into a manhood or womanhood, there's a temptation to kick over the traces and throw away all their standards, throw out all the rule books and just live as you like. They go to the other way. This is, this is, this is a phenomenon that one frequently sees when they go away to college, for example. It is simply the ancient tactic, folks, of the devil. That when we resist him in one area, he quickly tries to get us to act in the opposite extreme. It's all the more subtle and powerful, of course, when he bolsters it with Scripture. Here he quotes Psalm 91. He says, you trusted God. Wonderful. He says, he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High, who abides in the shadow of the Almighty, will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. He's saying, use your trust now to the full and remember how you have Scripture for it. The angels will bury you up in their hands. What do you say to that? The angels will take care of you according to what Scriptures are saying. The angels will take care of you. Have you ever felt that force of temptation? Has anyone said to you, look, I can show you from Scriptures that you can do whatever you want. You can do so and so. And you say, well, how can I argue? After all, the Bible says so. And here are, those many arg and here are all those many arguments based upon that Bible claim, on that claim. How many times have you heard people say, well, the Bible says so? Even an atheist will say to you, well, the Bible says that, then why don't you do it? It is said you can prove anything by the Bible, and that's true. But that's true if you read it the way the devil does. We shall see more about that later in our Lord's answer. But notice, how the, but notice the force of that temptation. The devil's saying, look, you want to demonstrate your trust in God? You want to, see your dem you want to, set, you want to demonstrate the trust in God, I see. And that's the way to do it. If you really would like to show people how thoroughly you trust God, here's the pinnacle of the temple. They're waiting below. The whole crowd's waiting below. Leap off it then. Leap off it and you will demonstrate how fully God is with you, if you, and, you are, and that you are a man or a woman of God. This reveals one of the most common misconceptions, especially as Christians. The idea that the greatest display of faith is in some spectacular demonstration. You hear this philosophy from healers, those who speak in tongues, snake handlers, all who are just looking for miracles. They're all saying, if you really want to show faith in God, you have to do some kind of miracle. The mark of a person of faith is that they're able to do something supernatural. Such a misconception. They can do dangerous things. They can pick up snakes. They can speak in tongues. They can drink poison. They can heal the sick. They can raise the dead. Ah, this is the mark of a person of faith. But the Lord Jesus, folks, puts life back in perspective when he reveals the truth. He said, again, it is written, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. The greatest display of faith is not in some spectacular demonstration but in the quiet trust of the heart that rests upon what God has said. Not just what is said in one place, but, but balanced truths. Perhaps the most important word in the whole Scriptures in, in many respects is that, is that one word that he writes and he adds again and again. It is written again. It is written again. Truth does not come to us in, in capsule form. It's a complete account. And one truth needs to be balanced against another. We have never arrived at the whole until the complete account is laid out and we see it in its total revelation. You can't take bits of the Bible and use them that way. You need to understand the entire book. See, this is, of course, the answer to all the cults and isms and asms and spasms who rest upon one scripture, one scripture quoted from this book. They can produce impressive volumes filled with their many quotations from scripture to bolster their arguments and seemingly support their, their, quote, their truth. But the answer always is, it is written again. There's a doc, uh, Dr. Lewis Sperry Chafer used to say, if they persecute, persecute you in one verse, then flee into another. There's one further thing in this account. If we are under temptation to demonstrate faith by some spectacular display, we must ask ourselves this question. Why do you want power in your life? To what purpose? What do you want to use it for? Now Paul, writing in the book of Colossians, prays for them that they might be filled with power. He says this, May you be strengthened 
with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy. See, that's something we would, we would all like prayed for us. For what purpose, though? What, for what purpose? In order that we might do spectacular things? Marvelous crowd-testing activities that will make people see that God is powerful? Listen to the rest of the prayer, as I said, for all endurance and patience with joy. Doesn't sound very exciting, though, does it? But folks, that takes power. That takes power. Patience and long-suffering with joy. The quiet life of faith is the greatest life. Now look at the third temptation. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And he said to them, All these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. And then Jesus says to him, All these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. He says, okay. And Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Now the devil moves into the essential, basic part of human life, the realm of the spirit. Okay? Now he removes all the pretenses, masks, and disguises, and comes up with a direct, sheer, naked appeal to the deepest desire of the heart of mankind uh, to place there by God that their life might be worthwhile. That your life might be worthwhile that they might invest it in something of value, make, it un make an unforgettable mark in the world. Well, think about it. Who doesn't want their life to be worthwhile? Who, who doesn't fear that their life has been wasted? Or to live in such an unexciting and meaningless way that, that when they're gone, they're immediately forgotten? Who does not want to be remembered and feel that they have done something eminently that's worthwhile? That's simply basic to our humanity, folks. It's not wrong. It's simply basic to our humanity. And the devil, see, the devil quickly picks this up and in a moment of time, taking Jesus to a high mountain in some wonderful way, showing him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. Story is told by a, you know, story is told of an older pastor. He said, you know, the night before last, coming from the city of Guadalajara, he says, we came up over the mountains through a heavy storm. And the plane buffeted about and breaking through the storm, we came down to the vast metropolis of Mexico City populated by some 20 million people. And breaking through the clouds, we suddenly saw this tremendous city spread out before us, sparkling with lights, gleaming like jewels in the dark. What a beautiful, glorious sight it was. See, in some sense, Jesus saw all the kingdoms of the earth and their glory. All that, all that has attracted human hearts, causing, causing people to sometimes leave their, especially men, sometimes to leave their families and possessions in order to win the power and place of exaltation and authority over such kingdoms. I want that over my family. I want to have power over that. And the devil said to him, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Now think of the force of that. For these kingdoms were exactly what Jesus Christ had come to earth to get. He came in order to win the world, right? That he might be Lord of all that he might be exalted as, as man to the highest position of the universe, that every tongue should confess and every knee should bow and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. That's why he came. Now the devil, okay, the devil's offering it to him. This can all be yours. But I like the suggestion of Dr. Campbell Morgan. He says, it's very interesting that the devil only showed it to, him, showed it, showed it to him in a moment of time. Just a quick glimpse, as though afraid to let the Lord look at, for, look at it for very long, that he might see the, the worthlessness of it. The fact that all of this is only an illusion, a sparkling, shimmering bauble. It looks very solid, dependable, and alluring, and significant, but when grasped, it becomes, when you really look at something like this, it really becomes dirty cobwebs. But you notice how Jesus, Jesus immediately sees through this. His reply is, is almost contemptuous. He says, he says, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and Him only shall you serve. Notice the conjunction of words there. Worship and serve. See, to worship is to serve. To serve is to worship. And only God can give the, give the value to life that, you're, that you are suggesting. The kingdoms and, and glory of the world will never give it. Never. What you're asking at is the deepest desire of a person's life to have a life that's worthwhile. 
that only God, that only God can do. Therefore, you shall worship and serve only the Lord your God, Jesus is saying. And immediately, immediately when Jesus says this, the devil leaves him. And angels came to minister to Jesus. Now, it's important to notice that in this account, as our Lord meets these temptations on the levels of the physical and soul and spirit, each time he used the same weapon. It is the same weapon, folks. It is the same weapon that's available to every one of us. Every one of us. He immediately retreated behind the Word of God. Behind the Word of God. He didn't argue. He didn't debate. He took refuge in the Word of God in utter dependence upon the fact that, that God had spoken. And the minute he did so, the battle ceased. The minute Satan was confronted with the Word of God and saw Jesus taking refuge upon the written statement of God, there was no longer any struggle. And that's very important to see that, folks. It's very important. Our continuing struggle becomes we are so reluctant to take our stand on God's revelation. We feel the force of the devil's alluring lie that we will gain something by this action or thought or attitude that is tempting us. We think if we don't do this thing, life is going to pass us by. We're going to lose something, don't we? And if we do it, we will gain a hidden kingdom which will be satisfying and such a blessed experience. And that's the force of temptation. But when we retreat to what God says is the truth about it, when we open up our Bibles and understand what that is about, we discover immediately the end of the struggle. You see, when it looks as though we're going to, we're going to gain by disobeying, our one retreat must always be into the Word of God. For here... Here is the revelation of things as they really are, folks. As they really are. This is the way to confront temptation. Not with our weak, fa uh, failing humanity, but with the power of the Word of God Himself. Of the Word of God Himself. When Satan finds himself up against that, you know what he does? He turns his tail and he runs. He runs. I have a sign hanging on the wall in my office that, that captures three captures three truths that have oftentimes been a source of deliverance for me in times of temptations that come daily, as just as they come to you. And the first of the three is, it is written, proof enough. It is written, proof enough. God has told us the facts about life. The second is, it is finished, provision enough. On the cross, the Lord Jesus has done all that needs to be done to break the power of temptation in our lives. Hallelujah. The third is, it is I, presence enough. His indwelling life with us, within us, is constantly available to us in order to break temptation's power. It is there. This is a radical, revolutionary thing. And there are few who seem to step out into this kind of living. But wherever it is attempted, strange things begin to happen. Not that, not that the life becomes suddenly spectacular and people go around doing miracles and wonders. Not like that but in the quiet daily experiences of life and the decisions that commonly come every moment to everyone. There's this quiet trust in the wisdom of God to meet each decision that comes into our lives. And things begin to work out in unexpected ways with unusual results that, that follow usual decisions. Extraordinary things that, that follow ordinary activity as God begins to work in human life. See, this is the secret of human life as our Lord God is demonstrating it, making it available to us as we, as we uh, by faith, receive Jesus Christ, that His life may be lived again in each one of us. That His faith is lived in each one. This is our seat. This is the secret, folks. This is the secret of human life. And it is available to us. All we have to do is receive it by faith. By faith. Father, we thank you for this mighty revelation of the basic secrets that make life sense. We pray that we may make ourselves aware of these, that we, that we may give ourselves to an understanding of them, that you will open our minds to teach us these things that are so different from what, from what we have learned in this world. Here in your book, O oh Lord, you have set forth the, the facts about life, things as they really are. And we pray this morning that you deliver us from, from shimmering illusions and fantasies and the phoniness and emptiness of the devil's lies. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
steps I cry to you In darkest places I will call Incline your ear to me anew And hear my cry for mercy,
Folks, thanks for so much for joining us this morning. As you're watching us Facebook, if you're watching us on Facebook, YouTube, or our website, which is www.centricommunitychurchofgod.net, um, we come on, as I say, 10 o'clock every Sunday morning. You can join us here at church every Sunday morning, same time, 10 a.m., 1100 North Reddington Street. But as you watch us online, please do click the like button. Uh, click the subscribe button so you'll always be notified of each new one, new uh, service coming up for each week, what time it's going to be, or what it's about. Uh, but also you can share any of these videos with any of your friends. Just click the share button, pick out your friend, pick out your Facebook page. You can share them onto your Facebook page if you'd like, so other people can see that. If you want to be part of this whole ministry mission and missional work that's going on, then share these videos with your friends on, the, on your page. So they will see what you see each week. Maybe you just might be planting that seed that is so important in someone's life. Remember that. Remember that. So please share these with as many as you like to. Also, like I said, on our, on our, on our website, you please go there. It tells us all about our church, all about who we are, our address, who we are. All our videos are there. You can click on any of those. You can, and uh, Over the last several years, you can click on those. Uh, please go there. Our, our YouTube channel is called Hanford CCC Videos YouTube channel. You can go there, and all the videos are there from the last six or seven years. Some of them go back even farther. And as you see, a lot of changes in me, obviously, because we've gotten a lot older. But it, it's been a process of just learning how to do this properly. It's not perfect. It's not a great, glossy uh, presentation. We do what we can. The main thing we want to do is just share the Word of God with you and understand that Jesus loves you. God loves you. He does, we do too. As we close every day, we, we, we do this. Now, right now, we just would like to pray, pray uh, for all of you. Bring your prayer. As, you, as we pray, pray with us. Whatever is on your heart, whoever, if somebody is really hurting in your life, we'd like, you'd like prayers for them, we will pray now with them for you. As we pray, pray along with us. We have several members here that we haven't seen for a while. We're going to pray for them, that they're doing well. And we pray for that whatever it is, they find a church, they find a gathering of people to, to pray with. Wherever you are living in the world, go to church. Go find a fellowship that you can really join together and worship with. Worship with God. It's important, folks. It's important for you. It's important to God. Let's pray. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I come before you this morning on behalf of all these people that are watching now, but also on behalf of those who need physical, emotional, and just spiritual healing in their lives. Lord, we lift their names before your throne of grace, and we ask for your mighty touch to bring restoration and wholeness to their bodies, minds, and souls. Lord, we also pray for doctors, nurses, medical professionals involved in their care, that you would grant them wisdom and and skill and compassion. And may your healing power flow through them and bring comfort and relief to those who are suffering. Lord, we pray that you strengthen the faith of those who are sick and their loved ones, reminding them of your faithfulness and love. And gracious God, we intercede for those who are experiencing right now in their lives grief and sorrow and loss and loneliness. And we pray now that you surround them with your comforting presence, embracing them in your loving arms. Lord, just bring solace to their hurting hearts and grant them the peace that surpasses all understanding and just be their refuge and strength in this time of pain. Provide them with the support and encouragement they need, whether through friends, family, or the wider community. And may your comfort, Lord, just bring hope and healing to their lives. You are wise and sovereign, Lord. Lord, we intercede for those who are seeking direction and guidance in their lives, young and old alike. Lord, just illuminate their path through your divine wisdom and insight. May, may they hear your voice clearly and follow your leading. And Lord, protect them from the snares of confusion and doubt. Help them to trust your promises and to walk in obedience to your word. Merciful God, we, we intercede for those who are lost and do not know you as their Savior. And we pray for their salvation and for their hearts to be open to the truth of your gospel. So just remove the blinders from their eyes and soften their hearts to receive your love and forgiveness. Send laborers into their lives who will share the message of salvation with, with clarity and boldness. And may they encounter your transforming grace and come to know the saving power of our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, thank you for this time, this morning, that we have spent together learning more about you and just worshiping your name. Lord, as we leave this place today, as we leave this time online today, may we be committed to worshiping and serving you in our daily lives. And just, Lord, just show us the ways that we can bless each other, bless, each, bless others each day. We appreciate the wisdom shared and the, and the connections that are made. We're thankful for the opportunity to just to gather together and learn and and just grow in your love. And may our hearts be filled with your grace as we depart from this place this morning. 
Help us to go forth with joy that only can come from you. With hearts full of gratitude, we close today until we gather again. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Folks, God bless you all. Have a wonderfully blessed week. Uh, it's just a great pleasure for me personally to, to come on each week and share the Word of God with you. The one thing I'll have, I will share with you as I talked about in the message today, take your Bibles here, or if you got one on your tablet or phone or whatever, read it. Read it and work with yourself, with friends, to understand what God is saying to you. To you. Okay? It's more, it's really important that we declare the Word of God. We declare the Word of God in our conversations with people. Okay? Declare your faith and declare the Word of God to them. Don't be ashamed of it. Share it with everyone you can. Plant that seed. Plant that seed in the world around you. God bless you all. Have a great blessed week. We love you all. God loves you all. And if God loves you, we love you too, as I always say. Have a blessed week, guys, until we meet again next Sunday, 10 a.m. God bless you. Have a great week. Bye-bye.